Want to give all praises, glory, and honor to Yahweh, Ba'ashem, Yahweh Shah. This is Roy Abbey on God, back with another breakdown dealing with the 12 tribes of Israel. This tribe, in particular, in this particular breakdown, is dealing with the tribe of Naphtali, the indigenous brothers and sisters from Argentina and Chile, okay, from those two countries, those two regions, all right? The indigenous uh, nomadic tribesmen from those area, areas, all right? from Argentina in Chile, okay? And before I go into the scriptures, I just want to say this. Uh, dealing with the tribe of Naphtali, first and foremost, the word Naphtali means wrestle, all right? In the Paleo-Hebrew, it means it, it means Napathali, all right? Its pron pronunciation in the Paleo-Hebrew is Napathali, all right? Which means wrestling or wrestle. All right, Shalom. So, dealing with the tribe of Naphtali, what the word Naphtali means, right? Let's go into the Strong's definition. All right. Of course, uh, Naphtali was uh, the son that that in his mother's womb, in his mother's womb, Salakia, you know, there was wrestling. There was wrestling in the womb. All right. So, we're going to see what the word Naphtali means. So Strong's H5321, Napathali, all right? That's the pronunciation of Paleo-Hebrew. The fifth son of Jacob, uh, and the second by Bilahad, the handmaid of Rachel, all right? It was wrestling in her room, all right? And Napathali, it says wrestling, okay? Strong's definition, my wrestling, Napathali, a son of Jacob, with the tribe descended from him and his territory, Napathali. So wrestling, right? So let's go ahead and deal with this, right? So this is some information I looked up back in 2018. And there and this is off of United World Wrestling, I believe. I believe it dot org something like that right so there's a pdf file and this information that they they have right and with that said let me go ahead and go right into it all right so this is the title the wrestling at the end of the world china aslakia the wrestling at the end of the world chile to argentina all right Introduction, all right, and end of the world speaking on that region because that's the mo most uh, southern tip of the Western hemisphere, uh, hemisphere, all right. So, introduction, all right, Just blow it up so you, so you all can see it. So, it's so it reads, um, introduction the research process aims at finding a physical activity that demonstrates that in this place known as the end of the world, traditional wrestling matches were held by our, our originating towns. Speaking of the indigenous people, we were able to document, we were able to, to document that in two of them, wrestling matches were held as a means to solve their problems and or prove who was the strongest and able to lead the warriors in battles against the invaders. One of these towns were originally known as Selkanum. Onus, or more known as Onus, of which we only have some references in photographic records from the Celsusian father Alberto de Agostini. Because this native people is extinct because they were part of a genocide of the 4,000 that approximately existed in 1880, only 500 survived by 1905. By then, the genocide had almost ceased. The few that remained were succumbed by introduced diseases. In 8, 1980, there were nine descendants, and the last one died in 1997. The Malpuchi are the other original group that count amongst its tradition with the wrestling as an instance to define a difference. In contrast with the Onis, the Malpuchi are a group of people in search of growth and empowerment with all their culture and traditions alive. Sakuno or Onis. The body to body wrestling was a very important fun among men. They practiced with the naked bodies, which in the case of former events were painted red because of their 
interest and desire to excel, they were prepared since young. The way to wrestle was to take each other's body and try to topple, being prohibited, tripping, and this procedure lasted until one is declared defeated. It sounds very similar to the uh, Greco-Roman wrestling style, you know, for you brothers that train, right? Um, you know, with obviously without the foot trips as incorporated, but very similar, you know, upper body uh, takedowns, all right? Um, another use was when trying to resolve problems or arguments between components from different groups or bands. In this case, also wrestlers and peers, although more violent, reaching knocking, sometimes to cause the death of a contestant, all right? So this is the uh, pictures, of course, them wrestling naked, all right? But obviously this is a culture and heritage of those people. You know, the show that show their war, warrior class, all right? Arboto de Agostini, is illustrating the sport with a photo, photograph states that the wrestling is always celebrated with great solemnity and interest, intending the... The attending women, I think that's a typo here, sitting in a semicircle around the fighters. This occurs between the strongest and robust men of two distant tribes. It means to, it means between two individuals alone to make known the superiority of one's own forces. In the photo above, we see Albert de Augustine, Cilician missionary in the Tierra de Fuego with his camera, one of the greatest Patagonian. Uh, explorers with his works and his and left photo photographs doc documentary evidence of the wrestling in the end of the world so what is this showing this this is showing um that the tribe of naphtali all right which consists of the indigenous people of argentina and chile and the malpuchi mainly because that's the largest group of indigenous people down there but of course there's others that is also that was named like sulcanum onus that is you know this of course, smaller in number because of the great genocide that happened down there. Um, this is showing you uh, Naphtali mean, meaning wrestling, them holding a traditional wrestling between their tribes, specifically down there. So, Malpuchi. So, I'm going to keep reading. The fourth slide. The Malpuchis are the, are the Mapadungan. Mapuche, the name given to themselves in turn, a compound of Mapu, land, and She, people, that is to say, people of the land, native, also of the Araconos. By the Spanish at the time of the arrival of Europeans to Chile, they are a South American original people living in southern Chile and southwestern Argentina. Generically, uh, gen generically, um, Malpuches covers all groups who speak or spoke the language Malpuche or Mapadungan. And particularly the terms refers to the Malpuche La Araconia and their descendants. All right. So this is the picture of them. You know, I don't know if you guys can see it below the image up. Okay. And just a side note, this is why we always use the term indigenous, you know what I'm saying? So that we're identifying those people down there by their particular names so that we're not confusing with the um, Europeans down there. All right. So reading on Mal the Malpuche nation and its people have historically been characterized as a warlike people, which was never conquered by the Spanish forces who came to this part of America, that they were preparing for a training system and in uh, promoting a military case, which was directed by some caciques, lonocos, or bosses, and where we found the conis, young Mapuche warriors, and its elite, elite who were the Wichis warriors, the high level of preparedness strategies with both physical and mental training of the Wichis allowed the resistance to the Spanish Empire. This training was called Kelele Lugan, waste of, it means waste of power of, of ant, which consisted of a variety of physical activities and where two types of wrestling integrated. Okay, so let's read on. Uh, wrestling taking their hair and dragged the opponent to the ground 
with his father with his forehead where were common in Palin games, ritual games made in the past to settle regulatory issues. The most common challenge among bo- among the boys was come to have my hair if you're not afraid. Such a challenge was never in vain. Stripped of their ponchos, combatants were combatants are placed face to face. Each one took the hair of the other and started the wrestling. The uh, the object was unlike twisting the head to make him lose his balance and and leave it on the floor, which was a victory. When one contestant is knocked, they separated and were put back on its feet to start the wrestling. They continued this way until one of the two would give up. Uh, Metroton, wrestling taking arms. All right. So those those are two styles. And uh, we'll read on uh, the Palin, all right? Palin, two teams with the na- same number of participants from... Five fifteen each located in two rows facing each other, distributed over a rectangular play area 200 MTs long and 12 meters wide, boarded with small trenches, each presenting a reduction community. Uh, competing for a wooden ball, paley, or a fungal, also with wooden batons, went on to carry to their goals to triple, triple away. Triple we, which are the short lines of the rectangular, one of one for each team. Whoever managed to get, whoever managed to get a point, tri, uh, triple or line, formerly all level community had their own equipment and play space. In Chile, Palin played a part generally of a program of social activity so that a game could be the answer to one of the following reasons in which the game would have a ritual meaning who's has been lost largely palin as mark war as a means to el- elucidate the ethnic disputes the winning team of a game ac- acquired the right to make final decision palin as an ethnic group convening to convening to discuss and reach agreement after the game recreational palin called small palin and pitch up uh peachy palin or pillar pillar cut ton when it was for pre- preparing for a game. Okay. So let's read the conclusion. This research has led to cultural traditions and customs rescued, forgotten, lost in time, which were common practices for the ancestors of our native people and filled them with courage and a, and warrior pride pursue through conversation with the older caciques to carry the traditional wrestling or local ton practice among young Mapuches as an integrating uh, activity in sport cultural development for them. This research is the beginning for later foster greater knowledge and growth of traditional wrestling in the end of the world. So this shows you that <laughs> improves that the tribe of Nathalie are these are the indigenous people of of uh, Argentina and Chile. This is they practice wrestling, and the word Nathalie means wrestling. Okay. All right, dealing with the tribe of Nathalie, because a lot of brothers and sisters will get the word gaucho confused right dealing with the spaniards right the spanish uh people that are down there that uh took just no different than how the white men up in the united states took certain aspects of certain aspects of you know black people dealing with the cowboys and whatnot they took that persona on even though it was start, started by the so-called negroes the tribe of judah no different than how uh, the gauchos, right? They took their cowboyism, if you will, with about with a lack of better term, took that idea from the indigenous people. Okay, so the gauchos are not the tribe of Nathalie. They're Spaniards or conquistadors. You might have some of Nathal- Nathalites or indigenous people from that from the tribe of Nathalie that you know del- delve into the gauchos, but that's not them. All right, so just give you a side note on that. So dealing with the gaucho, right? Because this is an old breakdown from the old one west, you know, that has not been corrected by nobody yet. Um, ga- the word gaucho does not, the the culture of the gauchos are not attributed to the pe- the tribe of Nathalie, nor the people, the indigenous people of, of uh, Chile and Argentina. 
the Malpucci, the Toba, so on and so forth. The Gauchos actually are Spaniards who took certain cultural here and cultural things from the original culture from our people who are of the tribe of Nathali and they made it, made it into their own and call, you know, call themselves Gauchos. Similar how the white man up here, United States during the during the uh, Wild Wild West, so to speak, took on the uh, persona of the Cowboys, which was started by black people. All right. So let's just read on. Read read into this real quick. Gaucho, the nomadic and colorful horseman and cowhand of the Argentine and Uruguayan Papas Grassland, who fl flourished from the mid 18th to the mid 19th century and has remained a folk hero similar to the cowboy in West Western North America. The term also has been used to refer to the cowhands and other people of Rio Grande do Sul, uh, do Sul state in Brazil. All right. Gauchos were usually mestizos, persons of mixed European and Indian ancestry. See, and, and that's a dead giveaway. You know, all right. Mestizo, of course, being a uh, people of native and uh, white ancestry. And that's mainly a term that's used in the Latin American countries. Right. And also can describe because from what I've read over the past couple of years, it's also dealing with people of uh, Negroid descent, half Indian, half Negroid descent, half Indian, half Negroid, half Caucasian descent. You know what I'm saying? Uh, oh, yeah, oh, Slakia, Slakia. But sometimes we're white and black or mulatto of mixed black and white ancestry. Slakia, I'm getting ahead of myself. But, but the point is that mestizo, that's a terminology that's used in Latin America that's not that is not was not originally attributed attributed to to the uh, people that were originally over here all right that's something that spain brought over all right and that's been used over here which established the latin american countries all right which shows you that the gauchos were spaniards all right because even when you deal with mestizos the mestiz that that whole ideology is 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 from European ide ideology. Now, of course, some mestizos could be Jake because their father could be so, you know, could be is from Israelite lineage, you know, indigenous people, or, um, they could be black, you know, but primarily be Europeans. Okay. Um, from their, from their own ballad ballads and legends in the literature of Gaucho. All right. La, Literatura uh, Gauches, Gauchesca grew and became an important part of the Argentine culture tradi cultural tradition beginning late in the 19th century after the heyday of the Gauchos, Argentina writers celebrated them. All right. But a completely different culture from the actual people, the original people that's that's over there. Okay. So that's just a good, that so that's just giving you an edification on that. So with that said, let's go ahead and go to Genesis the 49th chapter. All right? It's the book of Genesis 49. I'm going to go to verse verse 21. The tribe of Nathali, okay? Genesis uh 49 and 21. Nathali is a hind let loose. He giveth goodly words. So what does that mean? When it says Naphtali is a hind let loose. It's talking about the nomadic nature of the tribe of Naphtali. When you deal with the different tribesmen of people down there, they are known when you go dealing with the Mapuche, the Toba people, the different tribes down there, those tribes of people were going were known for their nomadic nature, going here, going there. All right. It's something that is well documented. This is something that you can go look look up as a as a uh, reference to their characteristics. And guess what? It matches the description dealing with the tribe of Nathali. All right. <clears throat> so dealing with the part where it says in Genesis 49 and 21, uh, Nathali is a hind let loose. I just wanted to briefly touch on the different tribes. A people 
that were known for being nomadic, because that's what it means. Uh, uh, Nathalie is a hind let loose. So it says this. So I'm going to go through three, three slides real quick. The Selkanum, also known as the Onawa, Onawo, or Ona people, are an indigenous people in Patagonian region of the of southern Argentina and Chile, including the Tierra Tierra del, del Fuego Islands. They were one of the last native groups in South America to be encountered by migrant ethnic Europeans, mainly British, in the late nineteenth century. In the 19th century, there were about 4,000 second them. By 1919, there were about there were 297, and by 1930, just over 100. In this tribe of people, um, if I'm not mistaken, is is extinct, almost, almost, almost to the brink of extinction. There's some uh, somewhere around those lines. Okay. Um, Uh, let's see, just, yeah, it says they are considered extinct as a tribe. The exploration of gold and the introduction of farming in the region of Tierra del Fuego has led to a drastic decline in the number of their population, a process that is described as a genocide. All right. You know, cause that's how that's, of course, that's the nature of Esau. Now let's deal with the lifestyle of these people. Traditionally, the Selkanum were nomadic. People who relied on hunting for survival. They dressed sparingly, sparingly despite the cold climate of Patagonia. They shared ter Tierra del Fuego with the Hosh or Manic, Manic Inc., another nomadic culture who live in the southern eastern part of, of the island, also in the region where Yamana or Yahagan. All right. Now, let me bring out some more information, all right? The Toba people, all right? The Toba people, also known as the Quam people, are uh, are one of the largest indigenous groups in Argentina who, who historically inhabited the region known as, known today as the Pampas in central Chaco, all right? <clears throat> so let's skip down. <clears throat> let's go to their culture. I believe culture or uh, just getting to the point. Okay, nutrition in agriculture. Until the, until the 19th century, the Quam were primarily a hunter-gatherer, semi-nomadic society that traveled in pursuit of dietary resources. Uh, there also existed a very distinct sexual division of labor. The men from a very early age dedicated themselves to hunting and fishing. The women collected food and worked in, in incipient um Agriculture gar gardens that were in large part influenced by contributions from the groups from the Adanian and Amazonian regions. Okay. So let's, let me bring out one more. All right. And this is out the Britannica. All right. Araconian Wars. All right. And our current Korean's Araconians. All right, are also people of the Malpuche, as I'm going to read. The Arakunians were nomadic hunting and gathering peoples divided into three groups. The Malpuche, the Pacunchi, and the Hiliichi. Huli, Huli, Huliichi, Salakia, Huliichi. They spoke the same language and, and federated from military purposes but otherwise had little political and cultural unity okay so this is giving an edification on the different uh indigenous tribes down in chile and argentina that they were nomadic people proving the point and it says he giveth goodly words all right as i read on it says he giveth goodly words and what is that speaking on 
it's speaking on how the tribe of Nathalie dealing with the indigenous people from Argentina and Chile, um, it deals with their their benevolence, the, the benevolence, the sweet benevolence of their nature dealing with their good words in terms of their advice, in terms of uh, their good words, good sayings. When you go look, when you go deal with their songs, it has a soothing melody to it. Okay? And that's something that's very glaring when you go do your research with, uh, with those people down there dealing with their music and whatnot. And it also goes into the fact that they're a kind people. They're a kind people. They have a gentle nature down there. That's the reason why the Spaniards, the conquistadors came down here and was able to overwhelm them the way they did and take over, take over the lands that they have. All right. And just to give a side note, Boy, Buenos Aires, just just to give people an understanding, Buenos Aires is not dealing with this. All right, because when it says he giveth goodly words, it's talking about their good nature, the pleasant words that they speak. All right. He giveth goodly words and the pleasant tree and uh, kindness that they have, all right? That's their nature. When you deal with Buenos Aires, it's literally talking about when the Spaniards came over here, came over to those regions for uh, for that matter, when they went down there, uh, they they liked the air that was down there, all right? The air, when, they, when it hit them, it was good, you know, when they were sailing over here, all right? So, that's not talking about any speeches or anything. It was just the good air that they that they breathed when they came over here, and that's why they named the they named the capital of Argentina Buenos Aires. Good ears. So yeah, Buenos Aires. All right. Now I'm doing the Wikipedia, you know, search engine. All right, we're searching this out. I'm just gonna go right to the etymology of uh, Buenos Aires, the origin of why that the name was put on there. Right. So. A lot of stuff to go through about the Jesuits and the different uh, conquests that they made, but I want the point I want to get to. All right, is this part? In the years after, right, that a story circulated claiming that a statue of the Virgin Mary was retrieved from the sea after it miraculously helped to calm a storm in the Mediterranean Sea. The statue was placed in that abbey. Spanish sailors, especially Andalusian, Andalusian, uh, venerated this image and frequently invoked the fair winds to aid them in their navigation and prevent shipwrecks. All right. And it says a sanctuary to the Virgin of Buen Airy, Virgin of Buen Buen Airy, would be later erected in Seville. Seville, Seville, all right. In the first foundation of Buenos Aires, Spanish sailors arrived, thank, thankfully, in the Rio de la Plata by the blessings of Santa Maria de los, de los Buenos Aires, the Holy Virgin Mary of the Good Winds, who was, who was said to have given them good winds to reach the coast of what is today modern, modern city of Buenos Aires, all right. So I'm just showing, you know, because I have to go and break this down because for someone to sit up here and say that uh, when you go read where it says he give a goodly words, that's not what it's talking about dealing with Buenos Aires. All right. So, so you know, just to give you guys edification on that just real quick, that that is a false doctrine and it's and it's a um, it's not it's not true. OK. All right. So that's not so just to give you an understanding on that, because people have broke that down as including that into this breakdown of Genesis of the 49th chapter in the 21st verse dealing with the tribe of Nathalie, just as a side. So continuing on, Deuteronomy the 33rd chapter. Alright, dealing with the blessings, dealing with the tribe of Nathalie. Alright? This is Deuteronomy chapter 33. And go to when it talks about the tribes in that family. So Deuteronomy the chapter chapter 33. And I'm gonna go to verse 23. And of Naphtali, he said, O Naphtali, satisfied with favor, <clears throat> okay, and full with blessings of the Lord. 
All right. So when you deal with the tribe of Nath Valley, when you deal with Argentina and Chile, they have abundance of, of certain things that they have down there. All right. Dealing with wine, dealing with uh, coffee, coffee beans, dealing with certain things that they produce down there um, through the natural resources that they have in that area. All right. Uh, and one of the one in if I'm not mistaken, they are the largest producer of copper cables in the world. Now, if and I will post that in the post production for for y'all to see that. All right, so they have a great, rich, and abund abundance down there. All right, which the so-called white men, the Edomites, that are down there dealing with the dealing with the Spaniards and dealing with the many different Europeans, especially in Argentina, take advantage of their great resources and the land itself, and exploit the other things that. Our people have down there as well okay so that's that's the blessing that they have down there all right and so when it says uh, uh deuteronomy 33 and 23 of uh, the part where it says end of naphtali he said oh naphtali satisfied satisfied with favor and full with the blessings of the lord <clears throat> this is speaking on the region of uh chile and argentina and the different resources all right, the blessings that the Lord would give them in these latter days that would be a beneficial and a resourceful for them, but also, too, that has been exploited by the so-called white man, which is Esau. OK, um, just have a couple of different um, facts proven, the proven scriptures to be a fact. All right. That ch the indigenous people of Chile and Argentina are, are Israelites in that that land and that region was blessed with many different things. All right. Of course, my, the winery, the coffee, soybeans, cat, you know, the different cattle that's down there, um, as well as the copper cables. All right. The different alloy that's made to produce copper cables. All right. Copper wire. OK. So. Let me pull out this real quick. The largest copper producer, Chile, has become the wealthiest nation in Latin America, according to the IMF. With GDP per capita steadily increasing, World Bank President Jim Yong Kim recently congratulated the country on earning high income status. And this was back in 2013. So, yeah, this is one of the... Uh, you know, Chile, you know, and, and this, you know, of course, is Esau that's that that um is benefiting off of this. But, yeah, Chile is the largest people, the largest copper producers in the world, it produces a copper, copper wire, cop copper cables in the world. OK. So, you know, that's just a great resource that's down there that's being exploited. All right. But proven that that land was you know being originally owned by our people and proven the um the fact that our people had great resources down there that's now being exploited he's tracy tan and spoke to chile's finance minister Felipe Loren about the country's copper outlook and its dependency on china the copper industry has a has been important in terms of investment in our country there's a lot of investment that has happened over these years uh, but we, uh, in terms of fiscal revenue, uh, it's also a very important source, but we've been able to diversify away. For example, in 2006, 2007, copper revenues, mining revenues, but that's mainly, mainly copper, accounted for about a third and even more than a third of the overall fiscal revenues. Now they're slightly over 10%. And the reason for that is that not only that the prices have come down, but also that the costs of production have increased. How concerned are you about a slowdown in China's economic growth? And demand will, it's very unlikely that it will decrease, but you will have, you know, slower increases, increases in demand than you will. Yeah, I mean, and that's enough on that, but that's giving you a reference point. Now, let's go back. And let me, uh, let me find another one. Um, Let's see, because even even uh, Moab exploits, you know, this is benefiting uh, off of this exploitation. All right. Let's see, where is that? 
Okay, right here. Copper that was dug out of the ground in South America, arriving at its final destination on the other side of the world in China. With high quality meeting high demand, it is a natural trade. Chile is the world's top exporter of high quality copper, and China has a rapidly growing demand given its pace of industrialization. Founded in 1990, Far East Cable has grown up as China opened up and is now facilitating its further growth, providing copper cable for power distribution. One of the company's most recent investments, this automated plant uses some of the world's latest technology, able to produce around 20 kilometers of high voltage cable every day, most of it to supply China's growing demand for power. It's copper's superconductive qualities that make it the metal of choice for power distribution. Nearly half of the copper imported goes into the country's power industry which still has a long way to grow, with China using about a fifth as much electricity per capita as the US. Our annual growth rate has been 22%, and our demand for copper has been growing by the same amount. There may be price fluctuations along the way. So yeah, that, that's enough on that. Let's go ahead. Let's go. Yeah, so also, too, dealing with Argentina, you know, they're third right behind Brazil and the United States of the largest soy bean uh, production in the world. Okay, so just giving you proof that there's a lot of uh, things that, you know, that are uh, natural resources that are down there in the Argentina and Chile. And as I read on, in full with the blessings of the Lord, possess thou the West and the South. So dealing with this, right? It says possess now the West and the South. So what we have to understand is that this is a geographical location, all right, dealing with the tribe of Nathalie. And what is this referencing? <clears throat> We're telling you that the tribe of Nathalie are the Argentinian Chileans, right? The indigenous uh, people of those areas, right? So when you deal with that, when you it's when you deal with uh, when you go look on a geographical map and you go look at at South America and you look at that tip of Argentina and Chile, they're the most southern countries. That's really that land is the most southern part, the southern land of the Western Hemisphere, even more southern than than Samoa. Tonga, all right, even so southern that it's not that far far off from Antarctica, okay, and it's also when you deal with that that land that region, it's also known as the end of the world, all right, because it's of the most southern southernmost part of the Western Hemisphere, okay. So that's giving you an understanding is when it says, uh, and with full with. The, and full with the blessings of the Lord, possess thou the west and the south. Okay? So that's the blessings that they have uh, down here, having that land allotment. All right? So with that said, let's go ahead and go to some, some uh, other scriptures. All right? Actually, I'm going to start at verse 9. <clears throat> Hosea chapter 11, verse 9. I will not execute the fierceness of my anger. I will not return to destroy Ephraim. For I am God and not man, the Holy One in the midst of thee, and I will not enter into the city. Right? So Ephraim represents the whole northern tribes, not just the tribe of Ephraim itself. So this includes the tribe of Naphtali. All right? So verse 10, they shall walk after the Lord. So this is giving you a scripture, the cross reference with uh, Deuteronomy the 33rd chapter, 23rd verse about possess now the, uh, the west and the south, right? The south being what South America in the in us living in the Western Hemisphere and them being in South America and not only not only being South America the most southern part of South America which is the most southern tip of the Western Hemisphere which is the reason why the scripture says possess now the West and the South 
So let me read this again. Hosea 11 and 10. They shall walk after the Lord. He shall roar like a lion. When he shall roar, then, then the children shall tremble from the west. When you deal with the book of Hosea, it talks about the destruction and the Most High's judgment upon the northern kingdom for their wickedness and idolatry. And when you deal with then with the Most High uh, roaring as a lion in the 10th, chap 10th verse of Hosea, the 11th chapter, that's talking about him uh, having his judgment befall upon the children of Israel. All right, and it says, then he shall roar like a lion when he shall roar, then the children shall tremble from the west. Guess what? We're in the western hemisphere. Guess what? The tribe of Naphtali is where? The southern, uh, the south, they possess now the west and the south. They're in the western hemisphere as well, the southernmost tip. So just giving you a geographical location to help further your understanding that that's literally where the tribe of Naphtali is, the bulk majority of them. All right? So dealing with um, the tribe of Naphtali and proving that that they that they're on the southern that the tribe of Naphtali is where the southernmost uh, southwest or the southwesternmost part of the western hemisphere, right, or the southernmost part of the west western hemisphere. Let's go into the let's go ahead and go into the strong skin of coordinates. You know, actually let's. Read it again. And of, and of Naphtali said, O Naphtali, satisfied with favor and full with the blessings of the Lord, possess thou the west and the south. Let's go look at that in the Strong's Concordance. Okay. So, let's see, possess, seize, dispose, take, right? All right. So let's go look at the word western, yom, right? Sea, Mediterranean Sea, Red Sea, Dead Sea, Sea of Galilee, all right? Mighty River, the Sea, Great Basin in the Temple Court. Seaward, Westward, Westward, all right? Now let's watch, now let's go look at the Strong's definition. From a unused root, meaning to roar a sea, a breaking noise uh, in noisy surf or a large body of water, specifically with the article. The Mediterranean, sometimes a large river or a artificial basin locally, the west or rarely the south, the west or rarely the south, the west or rarely the south, sea, far, faring people, uh, sea faring man, southwest, southwest, western side, westward, you see that? And of course, the uh, south of of uncertain der derivation. The south poet, the south wind. So, what does this prove? This proves without the shadow of a doubt that Chile and Argentina is the land allotment, and the Chile and Argentina is the land allotment and the location of the tribe of Nazali. All right. So, with that said, let's go ahead and go to Jeremiah 50 and 33, okay? Yeah, let's go to Jeremiah 50 and 33, real quick. Okay, because we're all, we're all trembling over here in the West, in the Western Hemisphere, all right? You know what I'm saying? We're, we're all trembling over here in the West, all right, as a whole, dealing with all the 12 tribes, which all this includes into the geographical location of where the tribe of Naphtali is, which shows you the scriptures are, without a shadow of a doubt, 100% accurate of the prophecies of the 12 tribes. So let's go ahead to go ahead in Jeremiah, the 53rd, 50th chapter, the 33rd verse. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the children of Israel, and the children of Judah were oppressed together, and all that took them captives held them fast. They refused to let them go. Guess what? We're all over here in the Western Hemisphere trembling right now, all right? We're over here being oppressed. Guess what? 
they shall they shall tremble from the west, like as it says in Hosea eleven and ten, right? So let's go ahead and go to Deuteronomy uh, sixty twenty eight and sixty four, all right? Because this all further substantiates um, and exemplifies uh, Deuteronomy the third third chapter the twenty eighth twentieth verse with the tribe of Naphtali or twenty what is it twenty Slakia. Yeah, this further substantiates Deuteronomy, the 33rd chapter, the 23rd verse, speaking of them, the tribe of Naphtali, Argentina and Chile, possessing the southernmost part of the Americas of the Western Hemisphere, and them being in the Western Hemisphere at the same time, all right? So, with that said, Genesis, Slaki, not Genesis, uh, Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, okay? Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter, and I'm going to go to the 64th uh, verse. And the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the end of the earth. So, so right, so from one end of the earth till another, the children of Israel shall be scattered. Guess what? The tribe of Naphtali is scattered in the southernmost part, which is South America, the southernmost part of South America in the Western Hemisphere. All right? Unto the, it's like it, and it says, And the Lord shall, uh, and the Lord shall scatter thee among all people from the from the one end of the earth even unto the other and there thou shalt serve other gods which neither thou nor thy fathers have known even wooden stone all right so guess what we are all over here in captivity in, this, in uh, the western hemisphere this all further substantiates that uh, that that the tribe of that valley is where they're in the southwest South, most, south, most, uh, southernmost part of the Western Hemisphere, which means that they possess thou the West and the South. All right. And just real quick, as a side note, yeah, there are certain other Mapuche and some of the tribes that went went over to certain of the Pacific Islands, like Tonga, Samoa. All right. There's some Is Israelites that are scattered amongst uh, those islanders, but the Pacific Islanders. Uh, go back to the sea line of Japheth, not from the sea line of Shem, which produced Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, which produced the tri 12 tribes. Okay, so just to give you a side note on that. So just let me go ahead and go to Deut Deuteronomy, the 33rd chapter, to close this out. Deuteronomy 33 and 23. And of Naphtali, he said, O Naphtali, satisfied with favor and full with the blessings of the Lord, possess thou the west and the south. They're, they're in the Western Hemisphere along with their along with the rest of their brothers and sisters and, and, and they're part of the most southern part of South America which is known as the end of the world okay so with that said I want to say first and foremost I want to give all praises glory and honor to you how about Shimon Shai much love to you, the priests, prophets, and elders in this truth brothers and sisters in this truth that said I want to say I want to say rise Nathali, Quam Napathali, all right, which that means rise Nathali, all right. And with that said, I want to say much love and shalom. Till next time.